Hi, this is Kathleen. Welcome to the final lecture for this textbook, Chapter 13. This is a very dense chapter with a lot of complex issues, so I'm going to try to summarize it as best I can so you can approach the assignments in this week with some clear ideas. So we're talking about ideological criticism and cultural studies. This type of analysis goes beyond the practical and the critical and becomes more about the deeper impact that the show has on society, what types of discourse the show represents among an entire culture. Now, you've already thought a lot about this in previous assignments, so it should seem somewhat familiar to you as you apply it to shows that you're familiar with. So starting with ideology, there have been many ways that a group of individuals' ideas clashed with society and caused change, but certainly we can look to Karl Marx as a great example. He was very determined to define a society by its class structure, and he believed that the concept of individuals having the same opportunities was completely false. He said ideology was only based on your social class, and that once you were born into that class, it defined you, specifically the aristocracy or the ruling class, the bourgeoisie or the middle class, and the proletariat or the working class. Now, they didn't have television in Marx's time, but if they did, he would be very interested in who was making the television programs and what they meant. In other words, what is the means of production and the dominant ideology that comes through in the stories that are told. He believed the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. For example, the class which is the ruling material force of society, that is, which controls the factories, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. So in other words, who's got the power to produce television programming and what does that programming represent? So Marx also believed that once the dominant ideology was presented, it contained no contradictions. So classical Marxist, uh, Marxist assumptions are, one, that ideological apparatus such as television contain a homogeneity of ideas. There are no contradictions within ideology. And two, that the person exposed to the dominant ideology will necessarily accept it as truth. So we can see how far we've come from that idea. Let's fast forward a bit then to how these ideas might remain true on some level, but adapt them to more realistic concepts. So we now accept that many conflicting sets of meanings, and <coughs> excuse me, discourses struggle with one another. And John Fisk, you remember in the textbook, who defines television discourse for us, states that it is a language or system of representation that has developed socially in order to make and circulate a coherent set of meanings about an important topic area. So in other words, <coughs> it's more realistic to represent characters who struggle with choices between their own independent needs and those of the larger culture around them. Characters aspire to better themselves in a world that presents challenges to them. Think about this for your show project and shows that you're familiar with, and we can see how this makes for much more interesting ideology. So here we are now, and as the science of psychology and Sigmund Freud's work progressed quickly around the same time that the Marxist ideas were formulating, we see that the individual in society is viewed as a subject, a psychological construct who enters the meaning-filled world of ideology through certain Freudian mechanisms. So sure, you can have class ideology and all the rules of the society that go with them, but in the end, individuals make choices, and those choices cause change, and this makes for great storytelling. So what this means is we can begin to analyze TV and all other cultural phenomena, such as cat videos on YouTube or violent video games, in the context of contemporary ideological criticism. So when we look at a show from a cultural point of view, we're seeing that it's encoded with many discourses by the television apparatus. We call this polysemy, which you remember from our first few chapters. However, we should consider that this is not without limitations for any society or culture tends to impose its classifications of the social and cultural and political world, and these constitute a dominant cultural order, though it's never univocal nor uncontested, which means there's always going to be a dominant voice, but there's always going to be voices speaking up against it in any show that you see, at least nowadays. So here's what this um, ethnographic researchers do. Here's what they do. They seek to understand 
the ideological discourses in the television text. They're concerned with the ideological discourses of the viewer, and they analyze the discourses of the TV industry workers and the television producers or practitioners. So they're looking at the story, they're looking at the people who watch the story, and they're looking at the people who make the story and trying to figure out how they all work together. So when they conduct fan studies, for example, they want to analyze the transformative use of television text. In other words, does watching television change our behavior, such as textual poaching? Do we steal ideas from TV, such as reenacting events or transforming environments or just using phrases like, have a cow, man, which is from The Simpsons, in case you didn't know. Um, they want to know what fans are generating in UGC, or user-generated content, what they're doing online that corresponds with the show. Here's a great example, created by the producers themselves, but allowing fans to create cartoon versions of themselves as Mad Men characters. Another field of research in production studies, in other words, what are the producers... Um, is, is production studies, is what we call it. In other words, what are the producers doing to directly influence television culture? We can look no further than John T. Cal Caldwell's book, Production Culture, which is considered the virtual manifesto for production studies. He examines how practitioners talk about their work, how they write about their work, how they display their ideas in conventions or discussions or demos, and how they interact on the sets of their shows. This is a tough field to study unless you're a spy in a production studio. Even with industry blogs like Deadline Hollywood, we have limited access to the truthful insights and purposes of producing television shows. We don't really know what they mean or what their purposes are. Uh, we can only guess sometimes. So here's an example of one way to approach production studies, a website devoted to the industry's own reporting on itself. This is what they say about themselves. So to be fair and honest researcher, if you want to be a researcher and you really want to get into it, Caldwell contends that blending four analytical methods together is best. Interviews with media professionals, analysis of corporate economic structure, participant observation of workers in the field, and the interpretation of work-related texts. So fully embedded, semi-embedded, and publicly disclosed deep texts are what we're talking about with texts. Okay, that's the end of part one. You can take a break and proceed to part two.